We're facing a real challenge today of bringing scripture into everyday life. And with me today is Ed Welch from the CCEF, which is the Christian Counseling and Educational Foundation. He's based uh, very near and involved with Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia. He's the author of many books. He's married with two children and eight grandchildren. Uh, yes, that's the most important part. <laughs> that is indeed. Yeah. We must not leave those out. <laughs> and so we're going to talk to you, Ed, about the whole issue of biblical counseling. Great. And perhaps you could start by telling us what is biblical counseling? Well, you just started by at least the way I think about it. It's, it's a topic. Biblical counseling is very simply how does scripture speak to the many issues of life? That's there's nothing modern about that particular question. That's been a question throughout, throughout all of God's revelation to his people. That's what the book of Proverbs is doing. It's, taking, it's essentially taking the, the, the Exodus law and saying, what does it actually look like in, in the challenges of everyday life? So as a topic, it's a very ordinary topic. As a, as a practice, as a ministry, one way to say it would be, it'd be pastoral care with a little p. In the little p, it's pastor not as is necessarily the ordained role, but as, as someone who cares about the very soul of another person. So it would be simply pastoral care. Now, there's would, been a huge growth yeah. in the, uh, of interest in biblical counseling over the last few decades. Can you just tell us a little bit about the history of how it's come to the fore? Uh, it, it's, that's a great question. The, if it indeed truly is the simple application of scripture to life, then, then there should be nothing very new about it. And there's no reason for it to be a recent movement. But, but in, in many ways, it has been a somewhat recent movement. Now, the church has never abandoned the pastoral care. But, but in many ways, by the time you get to the early 1900s, you see, you see the church becoming preoccupied with, with liberalism, and, and at least in the United States, becomes preoccupied with, with, with during the Cold War, with end times matters. Mm -hmm. And during that time, the best minds were, they were focused on, focused on, on, these on, things. on those yeah. edges of the mm -hmm. church, and pastoral care seemed to languish. Mm -hmm. And I can remember a quote from Carl Jung, who came from Swiss, Swiss reform background, and he abandoned that background, but he he identified himself as, as a secular priest, mm. which was very interesting. He, he recognized that he was doing care of souls, but, but now the care of souls had been, had been moved from the church where the church had lost its position in the culture and it had moved to this, this new secular body. And in biblical counseling, in many ways, it's, a, it's simply a, to put it historically, it's Let's, how do we do the things that the church has always done? Mm. How do we do real, careful, loving, wise pastoral care in an environment where, where there are these new problems that don't seem to be clearly identified in Scripture, which creates an interesting challenge? Mm. How do we... Depression itself doesn't seem to be clearly identified in Scripture, let alone schizophrenia and mania and, and all the other features of the psychiatric corpus. How, how does Scripture speak meaningfully to all the problems of life. So, so I would say CCF began in the 60s, 70s, mm, yeah. and picked up more momentum in the 80s. Mm. Uh, we, we called ourselves biblical counselors, little b, little c, mm. early on because we needed a way to refer to ourselves and we wanted to make it clear that there was nothing proprietary about what we were doing. We were part of this larger enterprise how do we think, how does scripture, the, the word and the spirit, how do they meet us in the midst of the problems of life? And, and this was a question really for all the church. And I think what we've seen, like you're saying, is, 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 is because problems proliferate, hmm. all the struggles of life seem to be more intensified now than they were 50 years ago. Not only that, they're moving from adults into children. Hmm. The, the fact that there are so many more problems without clear answers, there are more and more people who really want to grapple with, well, what is it that God says? And how can we, how can we find, new, if, if scripture is like a treasure chest, mm. how can we find these, these new treasures that God speaks? Now, you've been involved in this for some time now, going right back to 1981. So you've 
got lots of experience. You've come to it too, uh, through an academic route, so you've got a PhD in psychology, you've majored and specialized in neuropsychology, you've done an MDiv along the way, I gather. And uh, so you're well qualified to speak about this. How, how would you describe the state of biblical counseling in, in the church, in the US, and more widely today? Yeah. Where, where are we at with it? Biblical counseling in 1981 was, was simply CCEF when, when I first came there. And that doesn't mean there weren't Christians who, who, were, who were clearly involved in counseling. There were, and there always have been Christians involved in counseling. But the actual title, Biblical Counseling, seems to have emerged out of our institution. Is one of the things that has been so encouraging to me is, is we're finding the proliferation of of biblical counselors, biblical counseling centers, and biblical counseling training centers that, that they're, they're loosely connected to us where most of them have been our students at one point mm -hmm. or another, but they're, but they're not under this sort of federal system where we own the enterprise, mm -hmm. which we never did. There, there's, there's just a lot of people who are doing, doing fine pastoral care and grappling with that question, what is it that scripture says and how can we bring that meaningfully out of scripture. So I think what we're seeing is it, it, it are more and more professionals who are engaged well in mm -hmm. biblical counseling. And, and we're finding that, that lay people, which is I think where so much of biblical counseling is happening, as we'd expect from the scripture, mm -hmm. that, that lay people are, are eager to help each other more and more. And, and they're finding biblical counseling speaks accessibly to them. Now you're coming from a strong professional background, but does someone have to have that kind of professional grounding in order to do biblical counseling? Or is it something that, that ordinary lay people and pastors can learn and apply in their own practice? The first thing I think as you say that is, I think of the a missionary analogy, where if a person who is, if a person is a professional missionary, if they're not a missionary, before they're professional mm -hmm. missionaries, then something is not quite right. Mm -hmm. they're a professional mis missionary is someone who essentially is, somebody lays hands on that person mm -hmm. and, and say, we see how you care for people, we see how you're, you're an evangelist in almost every setting, and we'd like to free you to be able to do that more full time. Mm -hmm. and that, I think that would be the way I would, I would consider the progression of a biblical counselor, where it's, it's what you do in everyday life. And, and as you do that in everyday life, you are gripped by it. You, you want to do more of it. And, and, and I've had the privilege of, of having that as the, the focus of my, my avocational life, my church life, as well as my vocational life. So you're looking for people who already have a gifting or aptitude or calling or passion to, to do this, and then seeking to develop them more. So, so what do, do well, lay people need to know in order to start to practice biblical counseling? If, see, I, I think the word counseling can confuse matters mm -hmm. a bit because the word counseling, in, 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 I think certainly in the American cultural scene, and in, in probably in, in most other places around the world, it connotes something really quite professional. And, 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 and and I know I am zealous to try to embed this in, here's what we're doing. We're having a wise conversation. And a wise conversation is, what's wisdom? It's, it's, it's we, our, our conversation is going to be shaped by our knowledge of God and who he is and what he says. And, and, and so that's, and, and that's very lay. And, and so what we're aiming for is how can, how can scripture mobilize I'm thinking of Ephesians 4 right now. How can, how, can, how can Scripture mobilize sort of ordinary, non-professional people to do the work of ministry? And in that sense, Ephesians 4 identifies that pastors, they're not going to be doing the, the bulk of ministry. They're going to be equipping other people to be doing that. Mm -hmm. And so how do we, since we're already doing it, we're, we're all involved in helping each other in some way. If we have children, if we have friends, whenever we pray for another person, we're, we're bringing a kind of pastoral care. How do we, how do we simply grow in that? That's, that's our challenge. And one of the things that I found especially gratifying 
is a professional counselor, is, is I'm supposed to know more and have more experience than most people. But, but when I hear people I've had a chance to counsel, when I hear them speak about those turning point moments where, where their lives have just changed, mm. they, it's, typically, it's typically an ordinary person who loves them really well, mm. who has clearly been sac- self-sacrificial, mm who's prayed for them, who's followed up with them, who has shown up at their house at weird hours. Mm. We would expect that, that God uses weak and ordinary mm. people mm. in the lives of others. And, and I, have been, I have been blessed to see mm. that. So that's not to diminish the, the benefits of experience in, 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 in digging into scripture and the benefits of, of experience in, in knowing people well. But it's just like the spirit mm. to use to use weak people who seem, mm. just seem horribly ordinary to, to do very powerful things. How does CCF help train people in biblical counseling? Our constituency is, 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 is really very broad. It's, it, it's, the, it's the parent who wants to help their child. Mm. It's, the, it's the person who's married who mm. wants to know how to, how to speak to their spouse, how to love mm. their spouse better. It's the single person who has a real burden for for other friends who who have been been leaving the faith so so that would be that would be certainly a significant group of our students Mm. we also teach master's programs and we have so we do graduate work and and then we have distance education Uh, our training is so our our training is is both is both very accessible it's free on the internet we've had a lot of books that have been written Mm -hmm. by ccf and then for those who are are especially interested and want to move farther. There are, there are courses that they can take at our institution in Philadelphia, but most people end up taking them online in, in cohorts online. Now, there are lots of different schools of psychology and psychological thinking nowadays, and we might say that, that pop psychology or, or secular psychology has had a huge influence on the way that Christians think about this and has impacted Christian worldviews. Do you want to... Uh, Talk to us a little bit about how you see that going and what's been good and bad about it. Yeah, Peter, you're, you're, you're asking a complicated question and a simple question. The complicated question is, is even within the church, Christian counseling is, is, a, is, is really a diverse, diverse kind of discipline and, and what accounts for that diversity. So that would be one question. The simpler question that, that um, is, is how... Is what we're doing different than the the psych- psychiatric and psychological therapies that have really infiltrated the church? And and I think the the burden that I have in how the church has been interested by secular therapies is is and here would be here would be the the, the evidence of that influence. A secular therapy is essentially saying that there are answers, and we can. We can somehow find them within ourselves, or we can we can develop strategies to see ourselves through this particular misery. And and we as Christians would say that we can understand a non-Christian doing that, but for a Christian, in the midst of their misery, to be autonomous and to look for for strategies to deal with that on their own would just be it'd just be so sad because the what is what is our what is the most simple and, and, and most sophisticated response that we have as human beings is we call out to the Lord for help. And throughout the Psalms, that's what they are, the Lord inviting us to speak from our hearts to him in the midst of our misery. And, and that most fundamental, that, 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 that key feature of the care of our souls, of simply saying, Jesus, help me, is, it, it becomes less natural the more we're involved in, in, in imbibing secular therapies. Perhaps we can focus on a specific issue. Now, we know that, that many of us are struggling at times in our lives with, with psychological problems. Uh, anxiety, for example, is incredibly common, uh, not just in the world, but in Christians as well, amongst believers. Can you perhaps, focusing on the issue of anxiety, talk about how uh, Christians can help their family members and church members to be able mm. to 
to deal with this? Mm -hmm. how, how, can you give us some well, Keep asking directions. questions. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, I think yeah. maybe I'll start with that in a personal yeah. way. A couple of years ago, I, I began to have panic attacks, and which, and I, I should also say that one of the things that I've, I've, I've really wanted to know more since I've been working in CCF and since I became a Christian is how, is how do we take our anxieties to the Lord? So here I am, somebody who's thought about this for decades, and I'm having panic, attack, panic attacks. I, the, the panic attacks, the, the big one happened in the middle of the night. I knew it was a big one. It was, it was this, this jarring earthquake that was going to change my world in some way. There was no going back to bed. And so I, I just got out of bed and sat in our living room, and, and I, I began to do some variation on Philippians chapter 4. Was, was it some, what actually prompted that feeling? You woke up in the middle of the night feeling it's extraordinarily a, yeah. anxious? Or? It, it, was, it, was a, it was sort of, it was a kind of waking dream yeah. that I, I saw creeping up on me. They're usually claustrophobic kind mm -hmm. of dreams mm -hmm. uh, where, where I would be drowning or I would be in situations mm -hmm. where, where I wouldn't be able to escape. And I yeah. think it was a drowning kind of waking dream. That and was there a particular trigger for that? in your life that you can identify, or did it just happen? Uh, I, I would out say of the no, blue? I, mm. I, I'm actually a fairly good swimmer. I've been in near drowning situations, mm. but, but I, I would not say that they were, they were, they were necessarily triggers. Mm. Uh, so there weren't clear triggers to this. And so I woke up, I, I began, okay, think about those things that are good and true, lovely, and so that's good advice, and that's what I'm gonna work on. And, and so I, and in some ways, I was very encouraged that my immediate reaction was to go to Scripture because mm -hmm. I think 20 years ago, my immediate reaction would have been, how can I solve this and get rid of this misery? Mm -hmm. And then two days later, Jesus helped me. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so the lag time between the, the personal struggle and turning to Scripture was, was much quicker. So I was very encouraged by that. But, it, but thinking the right thing could never jettison this, this haunting image that was in my mind. Mm -hmm. After around three hours or so, my wife got up and asked why I didn't wake her up just so she could be with me. And my first response was, well, why should two people lose a night's sleep? Uh, but my second response was, it would have been nice to have another human being with me in, in the midst of it. So I really appreciated that offer. Around 24 hours later, I, uh, as I reflected on what was going on, one of the things that, that I really believe God graciously brought to mind was, was Here's what I did. I was trying to solve my problem rather than simply cry out to the Lord. Rather than simply say, Lord, I have no idea what's going on. Here's a situation where it feels like I'm dying. I suspect I know what it is and I'm not going to die. But I also suspect that this is going to haunt me for time to come. And I would rather it didn't haunt me. I feel a bit immature that, I, that if, if, if the specter of death is coming close to me, that I should look forward to seeing you face to face. And I am in some ways, but I don't want to die this way. And what, in other words, just, mm -hmm. just to speak honestly. And, 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 and there are psalms, certainly, that there are no requests in some of the psalms. They just speak honestly before the mm -hmm. Lord. And, and so your question is, how can we help one another? I, to, it seems so, so natural to, to say, Lord, help. But it is, if it was natural, the scripture wouldn't, wouldn't lead us in saying it over and over again. Mm -hmm. And... And so, a little bit after this, a couple, we went out to dinner with a couple, and they said, how are you? And I said, well, it's funny you should ask. I've had these panic attacks recently. Mm -hmm. And I tend to be somewhat understated. So this was a recurring thing. It happened more than one yeah, occasion. And, and yeah, and there's this one big one, and they sort of yeah. they kept going a little bit after that. And, and it was understated. I don't like to, I'd rather not bring attention to myself, given, given the option. And, and these good friends, they, they loved me, and they stop. What is going on? So they simply showed love by wanting to know me in the midst of it. And, and then they prayed for me. Um, and that was exquisite pastoral care. They, they, didn't, they didn't race through all kinds of scripture. They, they didn't go through all kinds of strategies to deal with anxiety. They simply knew me. They loved me. And they prayed for me. And, I, and, and not only that... There, there are different ways we can pray for each other. One is, is a kind of consultant where we come in, we pray, and we're serial prayers. We, and we pray for somebody else, we pray for somebody else. And, 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 
we're finite and we, you know, we can't keep everything in mind, but, but what they did was they came back a couple days later. We're thinking about you. We're praying for you. How are you doing? That was, it, that's ministry that's accessible to everybody. We could all do such things. And that was probably the most meaningful thing to me in the midst of my own struggles with fear. So how do we minister to each other? It's, it's not that we, that we have to have access to this depth of Scripture. It's, we have to know that, that, our, that our struggles are fundamentally relational. And in, in, in anxiety, it's particularly obvious. Does he care? Is he really with me? Mm. And, 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 and can I trust him mm. in the midst of a world that feels absolutely out of control? To, to simply say, how are you? And then how can... How can we pray together? Mm. That's, that's sort of the foundation of, of, of all ministry, the most sophisticated ministry and the most simple. And it, it's what, certainly what the Spirit used in my own life. Yeah. Well, we have this idea of the wounded healer, don't we? That we're all people living in a fallen world who are not approaching counseling and helping others uh, from some kind of neutral uh, okay position. I think J.B. Phillips but, but, was, yeah. uh, was one of your own who, who spoke about that, the Bible, Bible yeah. translator. He wrote a, a wonderful book talking about his own struggles with depression. How, how has going through this experience yourself enriched uh, your own life as a counselor? And has it, has it changed the way that you practice it all, being on the receiving end? <laughs> yeah. I think of that in a couple different ways. On one hand, we don't have to experience everything another person has experienced to, to have compassion and to, and to minister well. Uh, we, can, we can be moved by another person's misery even if we, we haven't shared in that particular kind of ministry or that kind of misery. Uh, how, has it, how has it changed me? It's a great question. I, I would say, I, I suspect it's probably, it hasn't been this, this, this categorical change from one style to another. It's been a, it's been a kind of refinement. It, is, it has given me greater conviction that simple things tend to be very profound in other people's lives. It is, is probably, well, I would say that the, that, that, what, what, what changed in my own life more than anything else was the privilege of being able to pray mm. more frequently. Mm. And, and I would say that that's, that's probably the, what's affected my own counseling more than anything else. Mm -hmm. I, I spoke to a pastor recently and, and asked how he does his counseling in his church. And, and he said he schedules hour and a half appointments, two days a week. And, and, um, and, and how do you structure that hour and a half? And he said, well, I don't really meet for people, with people for an hour and a half. The first half hour, I pray for them mm -hmm. when, they're, when I'm not seeing them. And then I'll see them for 50 minutes to an hour. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was just utterly brilliant. Mm -hmm. And I don't always do that in my counseling, but, but I, I would say that it's changed me where I pray more for people than I, than I did before, which is... What, what better thing could you ask for? Now, uh, getting back to the issue of anxiety or uh, panic attacks and the way it manifested itself with you, and, and you've talked about how the people who came, just by their presence, their love, their concern, their prayer for you, their being with you in the moment was a, was a huge help. Mm -hmm. But um, w would you like to unpack for us as well the kind of scriptures, the particular scriptures that were helpful to you in that, uh, in those moments of anxiety, and that you've found most useful to help others struggling with anxious thoughts. Uh, got me thinking a couple different things. For me personally, First Peter chapter five: casting your cares on Him because He cares yes, for right. you. Yeah. Which, which I, I could never make a whole lot of sense out of that mm -hmm. because. You know, at least my experience was I cast my cares on the Lord and all of a sudden it, it's like they boomerang back on me and I still have them and, and, and so it, it seemed like this cycle that I could never get out of. But, but seeing that the beginning of that passage, essentially the beginning of the sentence is 
humble yourself before the Lord. Mm -hmm. Humble yourself before the Lord. And, 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 and it might seem like a, quite a distance from panic attacks, but, but to say, Lord, you are God over all. Uh, and, and I trust you. And, and, and the Lord gives, you know, to, to paraphrase Job, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Mm -hmm. and, and you are my God and I trust you. So the privilege of being able to, in a sense, to not necessarily have to find a solution to anxiety mm. or, or not even be brought out of panic attacks, so I'm some, somehow cured of panic attacks, but to simply say, you are God, and I trust you. That mm. was, I think for me, mm. that, was, that was such a, a blessing. I think for other people that I've known, I think... It, I think I've known many mature Christians who struggle with anxiety. We all struggle with anxiety mm. in some form or another. Mm. But, I, but what I noticed was that they felt somehow deficient mm. because they struggle with anxiety. And they interpreted the passage in Scripture, don't be anxious about anything, do not fear. Mm. They interpreted those co as commands, as kind of mm. binary commands. Here you are with anxiety, repent, and now you'll no longer have anxiety. And I think there, the command form in Scripture can be used in different ways. And in many ways, the command form can be a kind of encouragement. In the same way, when I say to my children, be careful out there, be careful today. It's not, I'm going to be mad if you're not careful. It's, I love you, and, and, I, and, and I want the very best for you. So be careful out there. And it's not that I'm going to rebuke them if they're not. It's, a, it's an expression of my my care and, and love for them. And I think for many Christians, to simply know that, that, that essentially God is saying to us, you have good reasons to be anxious because life is really out of control and we are in control of absolutely nothing. And, and the older we get, the more difficult things are going to become because you should be loving more people as you get older. And, and anxieties are oftentimes losing the, the, the things or the people that we can love. And so we, we anticipate that in some way anxieties are going to accumulate. But to simply be able to say, you are God and, and I trust you has been, it's been a great gift. So I think a lot of Christians... No, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. And yeah. to go back to, to what, what I was saying, for, for Christians to know uh, that, that, that the last thing they want to do is minimize their anxieties because then that problem of we turn into ourselves and we don't turn to the Lord. And, and to simply say, Lord, indeed... I have these anxieties and, and I turn to you and help. That's Other that's scriptures that have been particularly helpful in, in this area of anxiety? I would say two. The, the, so you mentioned First Peter the 5. The transcendent, and, transcendent yeah. God and the imminent God. First Peter 5, I, I, this, this, the transcendent God who is over all things and, and we can trust him. Mm -hmm. I think the, the other is the, certainly the primary theme in scripture and you see this in Philippians chapter 4. The Lord is near. The Lord is there near. Therefore, don't be anxious. Mm -hmm. And inevitably, when Scripture identifies anxieties in the life of his people, he, it, it's, 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 it's countered with, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Mm -hmm. And it becomes this an occasion to know this imminent God who, for some reason, has come close to us. And now, as sins have been forgiven, he attaches us he attaches himself to us and us to him. And, and we can trust the God who, who is close. So those, I'd say those two poles are most of the teaching on anxiety in Scripture. They, they hover around those two poles. Some Christians can feel that uh, if they're anxious, that they've somehow fallen short of what God wants to them once for them, and that can provoke even more anxiety. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm not meant to be anxious because I'm a Christian, but I am anxious, and so that makes them more anxious thinking about their anxiety, and they get in a kind of uh, spiral, uh, don't they? And, and I think you're identifying a problem for men in particular, where women, see, it, seems, it seems culturally it's more appropriate for them to speak of their anxieties because it's a kind of weakness. It's... I feel weak and out of control, and, and life is too much for me. And, and most men, they feel like they're not, they're not able to use that kind of language, and so their anxieties, they come out in anger. Mm. I, I can't control things, and so anger has this sense of, mm. I'm trying to get control of things. And, and there again, it, it's, 
what Scripture comes to us with is, I know something about you. You struggle with anxiety. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's all over in Scripture. It's mm. everywhere, which is, which is such a comforting place to begin. We don't have to hide it. We don't have to cover it up. We don't have to somehow ameliorate it before we come to Jesus. He says, here it is. You struggle with anxiety. Now, let's begin here. Simply speak of your anxieties to the God who hears. That's, that's what we're aiming for in the context of the church, it seems. And I guess that's what you were alluding to earlier in talking about the Psalms, is that in the Psalms we see the full expression of human emotion. And, and David, who had such a, a close and intimate walk with God, nonetheless struggled with all of these things and talked about them. I, I mean, I've derived great encouragement from the fact that the Apostle Paul can say we were so utterly unbearably mm -hmm. crushed that we despaired of life itself. And, mm -hmm. and on another moment, he talks about having fears within. Mm -hmm. Isn't that an extraordinary uh, encouragement to us that even these people who had uh, God used mightily and, and walked closely with him, the this was part of their normal experience. Yeah, the person who's yeah. steeped in the Psalms. And, yeah. and as you're talking about David, you know, undoubtedly, what is it, Psalm, 50, Psalm 56, when I am afraid, mm. not will I be not afraid, if, or if. when I be afraid, mm. and when, when I'm afraid. And, 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 and here's a world where, where the, the nations around you, you don't have packs with them. They, you don't know when they're going to come, and when they come, they're going to either destroy you or you're going to destroy mm. them. So life and death issues were, 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 were even more palpable, I think, to them. And, and so David says, when I am afraid, here, what's, what's our task? It's not... It's not to be rid of all fears and anxieties. It's how can we have that rhythm? When I am afraid, I will turn to you. Mm. Rather than turn to myself and try to manage my world my mm. way, how can, I, how can I turn to my God who has made these great and precious promises? Mm. What's it, finally, Ed, what's your hope for the Christian church in terms of biblical counseling? Are we, can we make this some, much some more Some of the things available? we're talking yeah. about right now with anxiety, we're, what, I think one of the things we're saying is how can we be a community of people where, where we can speak openly from our hearts with our struggles? How can, how can we embody the Psalms more frequently? How can, we, how can we talk about our weaknesses and our sufferings and even our sins with one another? That, that would be, if you're asking me to envision what does a growing church community look like? That would be that. That probably be the thing I think first. That so that a are, safe place where we can be honest about what we're really struggling with and not feel well. You're saying condemned. Two yeah. where, where we can speak openly and honestly the things that are in our heart. In the community of Christ, they they come toward us, and, and I, I guess this would be the second thing. The, the the way to to not condemn is you simply pray for another person. Mm. For, for, for the community of Christ to be both of those things, we share openly from our hearts and, and we pray for mm. one another. Mm. And when we don't know what to pray, we simply ask them, how can I pray for you? Mm. Uh, and in that simple question, how can I pray for you? It's, it's saying we're not alone. Here's this overwhelming experience. How is it that God himself speaks to us in the midst of that experience? That's what we want to identify as we pray with one another. So I, I would say that's, that's, that's what I hope to contribute to in the Christian church. How do we pray with one another? How do we speak openly from our heart with the struggles that we have? Ed, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Peter.